I don't have to prolong your time, but I do have a word from the Lord on this morning. I will be speaking from Numbers, the 27th chapter. The first, second, third, and eventually the fourth verse. And you will hear there or see there these words. Then came the daughters of Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, of the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, and these are the names of his daughters. Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, Tirzah. And they stood before Moses and before Eleazar the priest and before the princes and all the congregation by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation saying, our father died in the wilderness. And he was not in the company of them that gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah, but did die of his own sin and had no sons. Why should then the name of our father be done away from among this family because he hath no sons? Give us unto therefore a possession, the brethren of the brethren of my father. For just a few moments, I will bother you with the topic, go get your stuff. <laughs> go get your stuff, not your, your, go get your stuff. <laughs> Many of you are familiar with the story of the daughters of Zelophehad, a story that encapsulates the challenges women face in the Bible and what they had to do to affirm their rights with dignity. For a bit of a historical view, the preceding chapters of Numbers, the 26th chapter, describe the children of Israel as they are planning to possess the promised land of Canaan. A census of sorts is being taken of all the males over 20 years old as a part of the list of the various clans, we read that Zelophehad had no sons, only daughters. When the census was concluded, Zelophehad's daughters were not counted as heirs in the census and also were not in line to receive their father's land as an inheritance. We now enter chapter 27 where the daughters of Zelophehad have responded to the news and said to Moses, where is our stuff? I want to stop here for a moment and recognize how unprecedented this move was. Yeah. You have to understand the severity of what was happening at this time. Let me see if I can paint a picture for you. The Israelite camp is formed of tribes, 12 of them, each tribe has a determined place in the wilderness. The tabernacle sits in the middle of the camp, and in the center of that tabernacle stands the main authority figure, Moses, Eleazar the priest, and who they would call the chieftain. As imposing and intimidating as the structure may have seemed, the five sisters decided that their inheritance was more important than their fear of established protocol. Their inheritance was more important than their fear of established protocol. So together they go, without being called by anyone, to a place where only the high-ranking men congregate, to a place where the tables of Sinai rest in the ark, to the place of holiness and authority, to a place where women were not supposed to have a voice or be granted an audience. You might ask yourself, what kind of woman Kamala Harris? What kind of woman Michelle Obama? What kind of woman Harriet Tubman? What kind of woman Sir John Truth? What kind of woman Glenniva Dunham? What kind of woman Chelsea Whittington has the courage to walk into, occupy, and inquire about their rights in a place they are not meant to have a voice? What, what, what kind 
of woman. Well, such a woman must be three things. She must be encouraged, she must be equipped, and she must be excited in her walk and journey in the Lord. Let's take a look at the lives of the Lopahad's daughters and see what the secret was to their success. Being the daughter of a father who has no son, I have been privy to the cynicism and snide comments that he has received about having only daughters. I have felt his uncomfortability as people ask him about his children and they follow up with, no son? The truth of the matter is that I can believe that the Lopahad's daughters were encouraged, equipped, and excited about their inheritance enough to speak truth to power because my father's response to the criticism about having no sons is to develop amazing daughters. Daughters that rival any father's son anywhere in the United States and worldwide. We're international. And I just believe that the Lopahad did the same thing with his daughter. He put everything into his daughters and taught them how to fight for what was just and what was right. It was evident even at their birth that their father was their number one encourager. Let me show you what I mean. From the day the Lopahad's daughters were born, before he spent any time lamenting that they were girls, decided strategically on what he would name them. Take a minute. With the choosing of each name, it was his intent, his intent to encourage the life of his daughters. His first daughter's name was Mala, which means forgiven. His second daughter's name was Noah, which means movement. His third daughter's name was Milka, which means queen. His fourth daughter's name was Tirza, which means pleasing to sight. And his last daughter's name was Hagla, which means complete. The Lopahad was not deficit-minded when it came to his daughters. He did not see them as an example of some masculine deficiency. He saw them as a completely pleasing, queenly, blessed body of movement, and I believe he called that a force. and cousin and friend and there was a young lady that 
that you can encourage, you ought to make it a priority. But let me tell you something, brother. You cannot be encourager, pro, uh, protector, and predator at the same time. You, 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 you can serve all those roles at the same time. You either going to be a protector or you are a predator, and a predator is my enemy. I need an encourager. I don't need the men in my church to be predators. I need them to be encouragers. Because once you do that, and you step over that line, you have now invited mistrust, disunity, and more discouragement in our lives than we need. The daughters of Zelophehad were encouraged by the most important man in their life, their father. Secondly, we have to learn how to encourage each other. I have two sisters, three if you count Tamika, four if you count Kiva, five if you count Coco, six if you count Jones, seven if you count Nora, eight if you count Kelly, nine, and, I can, and the list goes on and on. And I haven't even started talking about all my sister-like cousins that I have. And here's one thing that I can say about each and every one of them. Uh, we may disagree, but we make it our business to encourage each other as much as possible. Sometimes it looks like a shoulder to cry on. Sometimes it looks like uh, sending them a song for the day. Sometimes it looks like lunch or brunch. Sometimes it looks like reminding them to practice self-care. And sometimes it looks like correction and redirection. Now, I don't want you to get a false understanding of the relationship you have with the people you call sisters. There were five of the overhead daughters. And I believe Ms. Middlebrook can attest to the fact that they probably all had five different personalities, five different characteristics, and are completely five different people. And even though they come together as a force on one hand, it doesn't mean that sometimes those lives don't call them to have a little bit of separation. Because you're not going to try to convince me that we always get along with them. If it's anything like me and my sisters, somebody is too sensitive, too arrogant, too aggressive, too stingy, too stubborn, and the list go on. How many of you can think back to your sisters and cousins and know that is true for a fact? That you do not always get along.
function in the world because nobody told them who they were. See, God was told who I am. I, 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 I come from a long line of amazing women. I, I'm the daughter of Sharon, who sacrificed all she wanted to be so I could be all I dreamed to be. Yeah. I'm the granddaughter of Albertine and Albert, yeah. women who received their high school diplomas in Mississippi in the 1930s. I am the great-granddaughter of Amelia, Lily, and Doria, and Mary Alice, women who survived and thrived during the Great Depression and Reconstruction. I am the great-great-granddaughter of Dora Prentice, the great-great-great-granddaughter of Hagar Whitfield, born a slave on a Mississippi plantation, stolen away from her family, and brought to North Carolina. I know who I am. I know what kind of women I come from. Somebody, it's time for y'all to sit your daughters down. And talk to them about the women in the family. And tell them where this shit comes from. I know who I am. I know what my people have been doing. I know what the women in my family triumph over. I know their morals and values and their love and reverence for God. And when you know your lineage and you know your legacy, your understanding and responsibility connected to your name and your achievement is evident. So those that have daughters were equipped with the knowledge of their lineage because it is the strength that they were going to have to pull from to do what they were getting ready to do. Secondly, they were equipped with knowledge of their religious practice and culture. You may ask how I know. Well, the scripture says it gives us a hint. Then the daughters of Zelophehad stood before Moses. That tells me a lot. They had to have knowledge of their religious practice because they knew where the temple was, yeah. how to get there, yeah. and how to properly make their petition known to the people that could solve that issue. What would happen if more women knew where the temple was, how to get there, and who to make their petition in front of to solve that issue? There's a lot, a whole lot of issues we would not have if we knew where the church was, how to get there, and who to talk to when we got in the But I have to admit that much of this could be the result of one-sided patriarchal teaching. You see, although I learned the rudiments of my faith and how to practice it, my religious upbringing was also riddled with the respectability politics of the Baptist church. That I should always have on stockings, that I, that I should always have a skirt in certain length, that wearing a slip was not an option, that too much makeup is sacrilegious, and the truth of the matter is, I really don't mind any of those teachings, as frustrating and uncomfortable as they can be. My problem is, we cannot go any longer just teaching that. Okay, y'all don't want to talk My day be gone by the time I get back, y'all can clap. <laughs> you see, at the same time that Zalopa had was teaching and adhering to the customs and respectability politics of their religious customs for his daughter, somebody was teaching them that God was just, that God was a way maker, that God would fight on their behalf. God was fair and equitable. If not, they would have never had the courage to go and ask Moses for their inheritance. What we have to remember is to teach our young women and girls both sides of that Bible. We, at the same time that we are talking about aesthetic modesty, we need to talk to them about the fact that Barack wouldn't go into battle without Deborah. While we're teaching them to keep their skirts down, teach them that it was a harlot woman who saved the Israelite spies when they were scoping out the promise land. It's all right to tell them to cover their head if you're going you to tell them about the story of J.L. who cut off the head of General Sarah at the same time there was a battle between uh, While we are telling them that red lipstick is too inviting, we have to tell them that Queen Esther used her beauty and feminine wiles to bring her people from tears and to go against societal oppressive norms. We 
got started teaching, I learned the whole Bible. Not just the part that asks for their aesthetic and positional submission. It's all right, y'all don't want to talk about here. I know y'all don't want to believe this, but yes, we have to do better about how we train our girls. Because we are putting stigmas over their head and not giving them the tools to fight. Women, we know we got to fight. We got to fight everybody. The color purple ain't never been wrong. I've been fighting all my life. All my life I had to fight. But I don't worry about fighting when I know that there are women in the Bible who fought before me and that I have that same strength, that same courage, and the same love of God and power of God inside me than any man sitting on any pew and any church. We got to do better of making sure we balance that thing out for them. To let them know that while it is respectable to be respectable, you got some power in you, girl. And we expect you to use it. Lastly, I believe that the Lord had taught his children the promises of God and going to receive. And one of those promises was that they would possess the land of Canaan. The promise was not just made to Israelite men, it was given to all Israelites. So I can see the Lord had daughters sitting his daughters down one day and telling them the story of their people. All the while teaching them that what he has amassed in wealth and land was rightfully theirs because they served a just God who made promises. He made a promise in Jeremiah 29 of and he said, For I know the plans I have. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. He told them in Isaiah 41 and 10, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God, and I will strengthen and help you. I will uphold you. With my, can't you see the daughters of the loaf of hand trying to figure out what they were going to do when they daughter, when they did that, but the daughter, the daddy sitting there talking about the promises of God. See, the Lord himself goes before you. Can't you see their strength increasing? The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Do we sit down and talk to our daughters like that? Do we tell them no weapon? Fall against you, shall prosper. And every song that shall rise against you will find not judgment. Our babies can do so much, so much more if we taught them all of it where the promises of God come in. Now, with all of that being taught by the daddies, I, I, if I'm one of the local head daughters, my mind is trying to be dealt My father had worked his whole life to encourage me, equip me, to hold on to my inheritance so that I could have the chance and hope for a future. An inheritance that was left to me by my great, great grandfather. Can't you see the head that they went to church? My father lived righteously, served no other God but God. He was teaching me about the customs and practices of my name. He's been telling me about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's been telling me that we were slaves in Egypt, but God delivered us from the hand of Pharaoh. He's been telling me that God was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He's been telling me that my people walked through the Red Sea on dry land. And he's been telling me that God didn't just do it for the men folk. That he was the same promises that he made to them, he also made it to me. So when it's time to go to Moses, when it's time to go and get the stuff, the daughters of the Lord had, encouraged by the memory of their father, equipped by his teaching, and therefore excited to go and get their stuff, walk into the tree. Stand at the foot of Moses and require, inquire about that stuff. And see, here's the part I like. Moses didn't ask the rest of the men what he should do. He got a council of chieftains and a high priest sitting next to him and he never asked none of them what they should do because there are people that will profit off of your stuff if you don't go get it. what they think and go to God. And let me tell you what happened. And the Lord said to Moses, this is my favorite part, and the Lord said to Moses, the daughters of the Lord had our right. You shall give them possession of their inheritance among their father's brother and transfer the inheritance of their father 
to them. Some things we ain't got to ask nobody else about. Sometimes God just waiting for you to come get your stuff. Here you go. Here it is. Come get your stuff. Don't worry about what other people have put in place. Don't worry about all these religious protocols. Come get your stuff. And let me tell you something. Our earthly daddy might not have a hundred acres of land, gold, and silver to give. Our earthly fathers may not have left us nothing at all but our things. But my earthly father been telling me about another father. He been telling me that he left me an inheritance. I didn't believe my earthly daddy. Until he took me to the scripture. That in him we have obtained an inheritance. Having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And then this is the one that solidifies. Y'all want to solidify y'all inheritance right now? Let's talk about 1 Peter and 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance, listen to this, that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven, who by God's power have guarded me through faith for a salvation that I can pick up at a later. Thank you. 
God says, I believe it's true. And I'm going to get my stuff. Thank you. 